Um, we're going to have our guest speaker introduced by Dr. Chris Mendias. Thank you, <clears throat> and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Professor John Solaro from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, so I could spend 30 minutes um, with my introduction. He's a very accomplished scientist. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background on him, he did his undergraduate degree at the University of Cincinnati and then completed his PhD uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. He began his faculty career at the Medical College of Virginia, sort of moved up through the ranks, and then moved back to Cincinnati as an associate professor and then in 1988, came back to Chicago um, as, the pro as the professor and chair of physiology um, and biophysics and has been, was in that position for 27 years. So he's been a department chair in physiology for quite some time. Um, and he currently serves as the director of the UIC Center for Cardiovascular Research. So he's a very accomplished um, scientist. His, his work is focused on sort of the fundamental molecular mechanisms of cardiac and skeletal muscle contraction. Um, he's a very uh, well-referenced scientist, has over 384 publications currently to date. He has this awesome protocol for myofibrillar protein preparation from 40 years ago that we use in my lab today still, so it's been great. Um, so uh, he's had numerous um, successful trainees, sort of both of the, the undergraduate, graduate, postgraduate, and then also sort of junior faculty trainees. And so, so we're really... Um, quite honored and, and uh, pleased that he accepted our offer to, uh, to come speak to you and provide some advice about um, sort of starting up as a new faculty member uh, in academia. So thank you, uh, Professor Solaro. Well, I just want to express my thanks to uh, those of you who thought of inviting me to give this presentation. It's quite an honor to be among you and uh, <clears throat> to see this sea of these delightfully looking young people is always a very uplifting experience for people of Marty years and my ages. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> right? uh, and um, uh, I hope that uh, what we discuss today will be of some interest. I was just speaking with uh, some of the people at the table that I think these days, many of you are uh, inundated with early uh, career uh, information and opportunities, and I think that one of the things I wanted to say at the outset is that uh, it's wonderful for you to be well informed in your decision making, but I think one of the things uh, one must realize that people of our age had to make our own decisions in the end. We had no uh, mentoring like this. And I think when I was thinking about this talk that that's something that you have to come to too. Advice is cheap and uh, men and women with gray hair love to give advice. And, but in the end, I think that uh, you'll know yourself and uh, uh, you'll, you can listen and be well informed but make your own uh, decisions. And then of course, like I told my children, when they made their decisions, you have to live with that decision, <laughs> of course. So. Um, I have a complicated, I'm not sure this pointer works here. Hmm. This is a, a complicated pointer here. Let's see. Ah, there it goes. Okay, so. Um, I was asked to uh, speak to this point of making the passage into a tenure track position. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. And what I decided to do was to, uh, so I stepped down as chairman ab about a year and a half ago. <clears throat> and the new uh, head of the department is recruiting and got several uh, uh, people that he could recruit with lots of money to give these people. Uh, into a tenure track position, and it's a very important position because it essentially means a job for life. It's an institutional commitment, a big investment uh, by the university, and many people don't exactly see it that way, but when, from the perspective of administration and upper administration, that's the way it is. So what I thought I would do was to use the scorecard that is being used in a present search 
uh, at the University of Illinois Chicago for a, a research intensive department and we'll go down the criteria that are being used to choose these people. And uh, so this is right from the scorecard that is uh, handed out to people after a visitor comes through. Uh, the name and interview date, the evaluator's name is here with this rating. And uh, people are given this rating sheet uh, who met with the candidate, who went to the seminar, who just read the candidate's work, and they would list exactly what their relationship with the candidate uh, was during uh, the visit. And these are the, uh, the, the criteria that we'll talk about. And I'm going to touch on each of these criteria individually. And what I thought I'd do to keep this more of a conversation than me talking at you uh, is to, uh, after each of these, to maybe solicit comments or questions uh, from uh, the younger people here, maybe the, uh, the more senior people here too have ideas that I haven't touched on and I'd appreciate anything because I think it's very important to make these uh, uh, clear. You'll notice, uh, uh, and this might bother some people here, that there's not much in there about teaching ability. <laughs> and this is the truth in uh, high research intensive departments that the focus is going to be on research accomplishments. But let me assure you, and I'll touch on this again, that implicit in this is the fact that you will be uh, uh, asked, asked to do teaching. I called, when I was department head, I called them teaching opportunities. And the expectation will be from all of your other qualifications that you'll do that in a caring and uh, excellent way. So don't let that be, that let that fool you uh, if you're applying uh, to jobs that are uh, uh, research intensive. I had one of my postdocs who's now a professor in Canada uh, actually had to give two seminars. One was a regular seminar and one was that he had to give a mock lecture. So he just could choose a topic that he wanted to talk about and he had to give a lecture on that topic. And uh, we don't do that in this particular search but I think it's something that you should be aware of so if we go to research skills, um, much of this is uh, you know, maybe trite to say, but I think you have to keep emphasizing it over and over again, no matter where you are in your development. And I think one needs to have a clear and concise hypothesis so that it's clearly understood where you're going with your work, what your ideas are, what your interests are, uh, and that ties into a theme of your research. So one has to decide uh, what you have passion for in terms of your research project. So that being said, and I think that's fairly obvious, but many times, you know, I review a lot of grants, and it really is upsetting that people won't tell you their hypothesis in the beginning of a grant, so don't forget to do that. And I'm sure your mentors have told you that over and over again. Now this is a point that I think, uh, I wanted to try and raise some points that tonight might not be quite so obvious, but one of the uh, kind of evils in our uh, field in decision making is the fact that uh, you have to separate yourself from your advisor at one point or another. Whether that advisor is your pre-doc or post-doc advisors, many times it's more important in your post-doc advisors. And it's, it's kind of unfortunate in a way because the, um, the NIH and funding uh, emphasizes team research, and yet when you're being evaluated for promotion or being hired, it's your independent uh, successes and your independence is being judged. And so that might take some work, and you have to get into the head of your mentors to see whether they are simpatico with that kind of uh, idea and uh, to work on it and uh, it will pay off if you can do it. This uh, it was very kind of Chris to mention that paper. It was published in 1971. <laughs> so uh, it was on the isolation of cardiac myofibrils and my advisor was studying the sarcoplasmic reticulum and that set me off on studying sarcomeric proteins. It's kind of a strange way to get into that and there's a long story with that that I won't tell you because I'll put Marty to sleep here. I think I'll do that. But, um, the other thing is I think when you're 
uh, developing your theme of research that, uh, again, has tried to say the devil is in the details, but we were talking at the table with all this explosion of information. Uh, please read the papers that are most essential to your work in detail. Read them from beginning to end. Read the methods. See how they came to their conclusions and understand them because that's when you become a scholar in your area. You don't become a scholar by reading abstracts of hundreds of papers and have this broad, uh, not in-depth knowledge. So in-depth knowledge is very important. And the other thing is that I think uh, in the course of your developing your research, you have to be prepared for events that occur in life, events in the lab. My advisor moved when I was three quarters of the way through my thesis, moved from Pittsburgh to Virginia. He hired me as an assistant professor right away. So that was a benefit, but I had to deal with setting up his lab and helping him write a grant and everything. I mean, you just, you just have to cope with those things. Uh, and you have to cope with disappointment in science, too. And you just learn to be disappointed and move on. The successes, though, uh, outweigh all the, the rest. The other thing is, uh, you know, I've had students come to my lab and say they're looking for a lab that does molecular biology. And I say, what? <laughs> you, know, is, you know, everybody does molecular biology. I, you know, I'd say, what's your question? What, what do you like? What, what system are you interested in? What's, uh, you know, so I think one has to be careful that you, and the methods are enamoring. They're just wonderful. But don't become methods driven. Become question driven so that the methods answer the questions that you ask, and that will help with developing your research skills. And um, I just wanted to mention this because it's been in, the New York Times had an article about it a, a few days ago, and I've invited Valentin Fuster, who's the chief of cardiology at uh, Mount Sinai in New York. He's a world eminent cardiologist. And Charlie Rose interviewed him, and I picked it up on YouTube or whatever. The first thing he said when he talked about his own career, he says, one thing people forget to do is to spend a half an hour every day with no interference, no iPhone in your hand, and to just think about the big picture of what you're doing and to contemplate that. New York Times had a very nice uh, article about this just a few weeks ago, and I thought I'd mention it too. They call it task uh, negative uh, time rather than task positive time. And all of us are very, very busy, but I, I uh, actually try to do this myself. <laughs> Sometimes I succeed. And uh, so I think that's uh, an important issue to raise. So I don't know if you have any questions or comments about this t particular topic. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so you're, uh, yeah, we're getting ahead of us. We'll, we'll be touching on both of those. So, so one of those topics was uh, whether how important funding was, and the second one, this is being recorded, by the way, the reason I'm repeating this, is uh, that uh, how one fits into uh, having independence yet fitting into a group. So we're, we'll touch on that. Okay. Uh, I, th I think we'll be okay with time. I, we, we, have an, it's, it's, we have another hour. I'm, I'm, um, so this is research productivity and the impact of publications. And again, I point out here to ask important, relevant questions. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's good to investigate them aiming, uh, aiming to publish in the very top or top tier journals. Now for us, American Journal of Physiology, Heart and Circulatory Physiology is a top tier journal. Uh, you might talk to people who say, if it's not nature and science, it's not even worth doing or publishing in. And that's changing. And so I, I like to think of, I'm editor of the Journal of Molecular and Cellular Cardiology, and we consider that a top tier journal. And so uh, uh, the reason I mention that now, I, I don't know whether you students, but certainly 
professors every day I get an invitation, maybe you do too, do you? Somebody's shaking their head. An invitation to be on the editorial board of some journal of occupational health or something like that. It's just crazy. And then in the heart field, uh, there must be 10, 12, maybe more uh, journals uh, that I uh, refer to as predatory journals. They just want your money to publish in the, in the journal. And I'd be careful about publishing there because people are becoming aware of that. And uh, so uh, just a word to the wise to be careful. Now, one of the things in considering um, these applicants, a consistent uh, steady pace of publications, I've, in my experience, has been an important criteria so that you're publishing one or two papers uh, every year in your more senior training environment. Sometimes three would be nice. And so I think that uh, this is uh, related to some people who, and, I, and we've all worked with people, or I've had students that just cannot wrap it up. You know, they just go, we'll do the next experiment, we'll check this out and check that out. But there comes a time when you have uh, uh, to just wrap it up and write up your work, uh, make sure it's, and this is being emphasized today, that it's statistically valid and uh, move on from there. Now, one of the things, and I cite this uh, reference here because I think it's interesting because there's a current debate on these very top, top tier journals. And this article discusses this in terms of the fact that publishing in nature and science, many times these are underpowered studies uh, that aim to uh, develop a very, very novel hypothesis, but with not the uh, kind of uh, in-depth criterion which are necessary to publish a paper of high scientific quality or value. So this balance between impact and scientific value is something that's under discussion. Uh, and as many of you may know, uh, the, and here at this meeting where issues of reproducibility were discussed, and this is a hot topic right now. We're having a whole series of articles in Journal of Molecular and Cellular Cardiology on the heart studies, and I'm sure there's stuff going on at APS as well, and other societies are getting involved. And this is going to be part of your uh, experience in terms of the statistical methods you use to design your study and to analyze it. You've probably heard that at this meeting uh, already. But I think this is an interesting thought uh, uh, from this paper, and it'll lead you to other things if you're interested in this. And I would, uh, you know, really urge you to read outside of the journals that you uh, read in normally. Every Tuesday, there's something called the Tuesday Science Times, the New York Times, has a whole section that's a, a science. It's, it's just wonderful, and it's very easy to read, you know, with your coffee in the morning or something, and uh, to do that, to just keep informed. Uh, and I think productivity is fairly straightforward. Uh, I think in this country, people don't add up your impact factors as much as they do in European countries where there's sort of salaries are determined by impact factors of your journals in some European countries. But here we've uh, uh, still avoided that, and there's, I think, healthy discussion about impact factors. So any comments or questions about this topic? I think this is pretty straightforward. Okay, so this will touch, I think, on the point that was raised here about potential for research collaborations. Remember, if you step back, these are criteria being applied to candidates for a tenure-track job at University of Illinois. So I think uh, you have to make the effort to understand the work that's underway in the department, and sometimes it's affiliates. Uh, there's many ways to do this from the web, but I think you don't want to go into uh, if you're being invited for an interview, uh, it's needless to say you should understand uh, what's going on in the departments. And uh, many departments want a critical mass of, uh, of individuals uh, because that critical mass can lead to program projects, it can lead to multiple principal investigative grants, training grants, uh, large instrumentation grants. But many times the reason the multiple PI grants are uh, funded because there's complementary uh, uh, 
skills and achievements, but those people who are putting that together have to be independently, uh, uh, I mean, have an independence that's sort of recognized in the field. So I wrote one of these several years ago with a, a APS scientist called D Doug Lewandowski, who's a heart metabolism guy, very great scientist. And he studies energy delivery to the heart cell, and we study energy consumption by the sarcomeres. Uh, we got a two percentile on that grant because we have totally different perspectives on how those two regulatory processes talk to each other. We have a program project with four independent scientists that, again, they're independent, but they work together along a theme. And uh, so departments usually look for that. They, uh, uh, I mean, one of the recruiting efforts in our department is, uh, they're, they're calling it sort of an independent, just looking for the best person in the field. But believe me, that person doesn't want to come to a place where they're isolated. I think, uh, I think that you know, these different perspectives are important to your own career advancement. So I think it's a good thing to have this team-related research. It's been very good for me. Uh, and I think it provides the environment and intellectual and practical assets, because you need stuff, as you well know, you need stuff to do experiments, and it's expensive. And I think it's a more satisfying academic experiment and enjoyment of your day-to-day -day life, uh, which I think, uh, if I could just say, I think that the, you know, the younger people here, I think you should feel blessed and, and grateful that if you have passion for this field of work, there's almost nothing like it. You know, my daughter, who's in publishing, would think I'm over, going overboard. But it's, it's a wonderful uh, uh, way of, of life and enjoying your day-to-day -day life, which I think you can do in this kind of environment. Um, again, I've seen this happen where people have become so engrossed in uh, <clears throat> working together in teams that they forget that they have their own career path to, to develop. And this, whether it's right or wrong, it's the truth that uh, you, uh, your funding and your advancement in the system will depend on something related to your identity. And uh, I think you have to uh, find out how departments deal with this uh, to make sure that the people they hire uh, can have a career path that's not swallowed up by collaborations that might stall your career. So this, it's like many things in life, this balance of activities. So any comments about this that anybody wants to make? Any questions? Okay. Um, undoubtedly, you'll be asked to give a seminar. And the quality of that seminar is another one of the criteria. It's just this broad thing with these numerical ratings, you know, one to five. Uh, so I think it's very important to convey excitement about your work, and I hope one doesn't have to think about that very much, that you are excited about your work. And then one of the things that I always encourage my own students to do, even the, to go to all the seminars that they can, uh, and sometimes the information that they hear is not that interesting to them, or it seems like it's out of there, but see how, the, think about how the person presents that and learn from that, learn how they do it poorly and learn how they do it uh, exquisitely. And I learned a lot from listening to people give uh, seminars uh, about that. I think clear and concise is very important and you have to avoid the temptation of putting in too many slides. And m most uh, uh, senior people, including yours truly, it's a real struggle for me to take slides out. Because you want to talk about everything you're doing. And it turns out, I hope this doesn't happen here, but after about a half an hour or 45 minutes, you lose, people are, they're gone. And if you say, you know, if you say, well, well then, uh, you know, this is the first half of my talk and it's 45 minutes into the talk. <laughs> and then you know, you'll lose them even faster. So I think it's something that has to be done consciously uh, and uh, so that you uh, don't suffer clarity and excitement about your work. And people don't need to see 40 uh, Western blots on a slide to make a point about 
a, you know, one change in an enzyme or molecule. Um, this is important. I think you have to, in, in such a, uh, um, a talk, to make clear your contributions to the work and acknowledge others involved, but don't go off message with regard to your contributions. Because we've had candidates that have come through, and it's not clear. So this is a, a particular one. It was a, a lot of heavy mass spectrometry. We do a lot of mass spectrometry in our program project in my lab. And you just knew that when she was talking about this, it was all farmed out, and she really didn't understand it. And uh, so that came across in private questioning, as I didn't want to embarrass her in front of, uh, well, giving her talk. But she, you know, th this was a negative point for her. Whereas she could have emphasized what the mass spec is telling her and the, uh, that she's really smart to use a very powerful technique and to emphasize how she can contribute to the study, for example. So uh, I think, again, it's this, uh, this balance. Uh, and it's needless to say, uh, you have to say where you're going with these studies. And uh, following these seminars in our department, we have lunch with the candidate and a so-called chalk talk. And in that chalk talk, no slides, it's a real uh, whiteboard. And they have to talk about what their ideas are on a whiteboard. And so it, uh, um, I don't know how much opportunity you have to think on your feet like that and to use a blackboard or whiteboard. But you, know, you can practice that with your mentor in terms of designing your experiments. Everything isn't canned. And uh, you have to think on your feet many times. It used to be that for um, many grants, there were interviews. You were interviewed for established investigatorship grants. You had to go somewhere and be interviewed and stand at a blackboard and be grilled. And uh, program projects were site visited. And people came to your lab and you know, asked you questions. You had to be prepared for that. Some of that still goes on, but in this context, it would be important. Any comments about seminars or questions? Okay, it's, it's fine, no problem. So uh, now uh, this is another criteria, educational background and academic career. And that's kind of a fuzzy concept, uh, but that's the, the way it is. And uh, uh, pedigree does matter. And uh, I think that and this is my own bias, others might have a different opinion. I, I think that your, your uh, undergraduate or your pre-doctoral advisors, are, they certainly were critical for me, very, very critical for me in terms of uh, uh, making me fall in love with physiology, which was a really a very, very important. I just, I was really not, I had an extraordinary, I went to pharmacy school undergraduate, and I had this awful physiology professor, he was dreadful. And he used to read from a notebook like this and didn't lift up his head when he was lecturing. And we used to go get a cup of coffee during the lecture because it was all written out already. And then I had my, uh, you know, my eyes lifted into what a magnificent field we're in. Uh, but postdoctoral fellows and postdoctoral training is going to be closest to your uh, path of uh, the next path you take. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think it's okay to have a nonlinear path. I did. I s switched from pharmacology to physiology. Uh, you know, I, I got a job right away, but then I left. I worked in England for a while doing what was essentially a sabbatical, but it was really a postdoctoral experience, so that could work. Now, this is, comes to your other question, too, about funding. So particularly with your postdoctoral fellows, but I, when I was talking at the table, uh, these individuals were writing pre-doctoral American Heart Association grants, for example. So that's really important. But one of the things that set the candidates for a tenure track position apart was to have some transitional grant. And these so-called kangaroo grants, the K99ROOs, are uh, uh, very competitive. I had one of my fellows, he's a now a, a associate professor at Ohio State University, and he had three job offers uh, on the basis of this because it's, uh, it's, it's money uh, to start out, it's salary dollars, 
It's evidence that you can write a grant and get it because this grant really has to separate you from your advisor. You won't get it otherwise. And that's true of these AHA career development grants. And uh, I hope that everybody in this room is being uh, mentored in terms of a so-called individual development plan, an IDP. This is required for uh, by NIH these days and certainly promoted by the American Physiological Society, critical to training grants. And so if, if this is a new word for you, check with your advisor about this or, or Google it and you'll see a lot about that. Uh, and uh, you know, talk to people who've gotten these grants. You can find this out on NIH Reporter or by word of mouth and see what they did to get these. These are critical transitional grants which I think are important. Um, and this also comes back to that earlier question. You should have strong academic assets related to the department that's interviewing you in some way, shape, or form. I mean, one of the candidates who got a job uh, is studying uh, worms, C. elegans. But his studies of C. elegans, and many of you may know that this is very powerful approaches in C. elegans, were tailored to the interests of the new departmental head in our department. And so he got the job. Um, this is important in terms of your letters of support. If you can get them from, this is true of, uh, I served on review panels for F31 grants and F30s, F32s. And it was always important to have letters, outside letters from people that weren't your neighbor in the lab, if you can do that. And that requires something which you hear a lot about, and that's networking and or being active in the community of extramural scientists. So if you have a poster here and you're meeting people, make sure they know who you are, that you did the work, your mentor did not do the work, you did the work in the lab, and get to know them in one way or another uh, to be part of the community. And being part of the community is, is of great benefit in, in your career path. And I think that's you know, part of this academic career too. Uh, these letters are, are pretty critical um, in the grants and in these job applications uh, and certainly as you go along in terms of your promotions, et cetera. So any comments about this? Yes, Chris? An increasingly important sort of factor in, in search, especially for medical schools so like Michigan, we almost never look at a candidate unless they have a K99 coming right. in as an assistant professor. And one of the things that they've done is they've shortened the time period now for K99s, so you can't postdoc for more than four That's years. Right. That's right. And so we've been discussing about whether students that want to then do academics, and they're sure of it, if they're going to do then longer PhDs because there's no cap on the time limit for a PhDs. You know, and so I was wondering what you thought about the K99s and sort of where they, they might be going. Yeah, uh, um, you know, I mean, think you make a very good point and, they, and this, uh, the clock has been a problem with some of the fellows in my lab too in terms of getting a K99. I honestly had not thought about the fact that you could balance this off by staying in your PhD longer. I don't know financially or otherwise how that works, but uh, I guess it's something one might think about. Uh, and uh, I think it's a wonderful mechanism and uh, certainly the people that have these, it's not exclusive, you don't have to have it, but they sift to the top of uh, the list and they're the ones that have a number of job offers too. Usually the people that you try to hire have more than one offer that they're at that quality, but that's a good point though. Yes, uh-huh. I also wanted to add a, a comment to to that, and um, I think that uh, I, I would I would not be a proponent of having the predoctoral extend his time. I think it's uh, it's one of those real. I mean, I think NIH is coming to this. It, you know, it's a reality that you have to face as as a scientist that. <laughs> You know, if you can't get it in, in that four years, then there's plenty of other options. 
So you shouldn't be you shouldn't be extending yourself past that because maybe there's other options for you to take instead of uh, going into academia if you're not if you're not fitting the qualifications of the K99 at that point. <coughs> so so I, I'm all for I'm I'm for shorting shortening. Uh, I think that's a good idea to have the K99 be four years for postdocs. Um, but my my question was uh, in regards to letters. Is there um, you know, most usually ask for three. Is, would it, is it wise to have more, or can you have more? Does it look good or bad, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, you can, uh, I mean, for a job application, you could probably have as many as you'd like. It would seem a little strange to me that have maybe more than four. I don't know why that would be. It's like it's overkill. I think, I think if you have three really good ones, that it's more powerful than to have a bunch of... Uh, letters, you know. And I think your comment comes under the fact that you have to make your own decisions about these issues, yes. Uh -huh. um, I think this is a question probably more for uh, the graduate students in the room. And when you talk about the pedigree mattering and choosing your mentor, I just wanted to know what your opinion is on Choosing a postdoc that's not that's probably maybe outside of your predoctoral area of research and interest to kind of expand a person's wheelhouse and their experience and skill set to make them more does that make them more attractive when they do go out for K ninety nines and other grants and transitioning into faculty positions to have more of a diverse background rather than kind of staying in the same area throughout their career. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, and I think uh, most people would agree <clears throat> that you should use that opportunity to expand. I call it expanding your horizons. And uh, this can be done uh, within the theme of your research interests. I mean, you know, for me, I could read about cardiac function in the heart, and so I could read about that day and night. But there's a, so many dimensions to it that uh, you could take in terms of training. And so I think thematically, you have some sort of theme of your interests, but certainly broadening your horizons and broadening your, the perspectives people have on, on science, you know, is, is, are different among different mentors. And then you could be, you know, take that in and then apply it to your own uh, career path. So that's a very good point. But I usually advise my own students to uh, not stay in exactly, don't do exactly what we're doing in just another lab that has a fancier machine or something. You know. um, hi, I have a question. I don't know if this is um, depending on the field that you're in, but how common or uncommon is it to hire somebody that is coming in with their own funding? Because all of the experience that I've had with people coming into a position didn't necessarily come in with funding, but just secured funding after they were hired. Yeah, so when I was uh, head of department, um, I did both. I had some recruits uh, near the end of the time that I was, because uh, we just, we had people moving on and leaving. And I hired a, uh, a scientist who had extraordinarily great promise, did not have a, a K99 or other funding but a wonderful track record of, publica track record of publications. Uh, she was, uh, we were trying to develop cancer-related research in one section of the department, uh, and she came, uh, and the dean was, uh, you know, questioning my decision, but he said, you know, John, I trust your decision, which was quite an honor. <laughs> And so then that put me on the spot, too, because you know, you I had to climb into the box with her. So she has three NIH grants right now, and, and uh, she just, she's a fully tenured associate professor. And there's some people that just really, really stand out. And she had trained with the uh, uh, Katz and Olenbogen at uh, University of Illinois, and they published these beautiful papers. And uh, you know, when I got to know her, she knew what she was doing and very uh, interesting background, for example. So she was an engineer. She did undergraduate at Northwestern in engineering. She did a master's degree in scientific writing. And then she did a PhD in, uh, in uh, basic uh, endocrinology at the uh, University of uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So she had this uh, 
what, what this is sort of saying, this educational background, which I felt she could do very well. So I also hired another young man from Dana-Farber with a K99. He's got a, an R01 doing very, very well. So both of them have done very well. So I think this depends on uh, this scorecard, the individuals, the department head, and but I, I definitely, she had two other job offers too. So I, I really wanted her to come to our department, she did. <laughs> other questions? Okay. So this also touches on your point in fitting with departmental needs and mission. And I think that uh, these are things where you have to investigate the department, understand their emphasis and mission. And most departments will have uh, a theme and emphasis, most often, many times anyways, reflecting the department heads. Uh, so our department reflected me, it was hearts, it was, uh, you know, calcium regulation, sarcomeres. The new department heads a vascular biologist. So things are turning over in a very nice way. But on the other hand, um, he is uh, studying Notch, which many of you have heard of. Uh, and uh, we didn't study Notch in the heart. And there are some people who study this. This is Notch as a developmental uh, factor that is highly, highly significant. So what has happened to the people that I work with uh, and on our own lab is that we've tied into his expertise because the new people coming in are notch experts. And so we're taking advantage of that. Um, so, I mean, sometimes you just have to talk to people directly and ask them what their perception of the theme is. Uh, and uh, as best you can, uh, I think it's, it's an advantage to fit your uh, future into the departmental plans. And the other thing, and maybe this will come up again, but uh, one of the things that I found is that you can do a lot more than you probably think. You could probably have parallel projects as, I mean, I, I'm a believer in sort of pushing yourself to the limit without going crazy, but I think you can do parallel projects even as a pre-doc, you know, one project online with your thesis and maybe another project on the side. And that, those kinds of side projects become these future directions which can fit into the overall strengths of the uh, university. And uh, uh, I mean, I could go into many, many examples, but I'll begin to bore you, I think. But uh, I think you know what I'm saying about uh, fitting in. Any comments or? Okay. Um, this one's uh, particularly important for me as a department head. I just could not hire somebody if I had uh, bad vibrations with them. This is a, I don't know, I'm, I'm of Italian descent. Maybe there's something about that. I don't know. But I had a guy who came to visit and uh, stayed at the Allerton Hotel downtown, which was the hotel that I stayed in when I was being recruited. And all he did, I picked him up, never had met him, he was a really good candidate. All he did was complain about the hotel room. And I thought, this guy's going to be a pain uh, in the department. <laughs> and sometimes these kind of uh, knee-jerk reactions are not fair, but we're all human. And uh, so it turned out that during the day, uh, it was verified that nobody wanted to work with this guy. <laughs> so, but anyways, uh, this is uh, more important than you may realize in terms of uh, uh, as I just mentioned, if you have an overall lack of interpersonal skills, uh, it's negative. And uh, this is what your mom told you, you know, as I said, they just reflect what your mother told you, being nice and considerate, getting along with others, caring about others. And this translates, uh, you know, when you see individuals like this, this translates into their relationship with uh, teaching of research and the teaching of, of students at all levels. So this is where teaching ability and law apart from the seminar comes in. Uh, departments highly value collegiality and caring about those you teach and those you work with, uh, unrelated to the departmental hierarchy. So what do I mean by that? I mean that the lowest secretary on the ladder is very important person in your life. And you don't wanna treat 
those people. I mean, you should do this without any, anybody having to mention it, but those people should be treated as professionals and you should appreciate the job they're doing and help them to help you. And that will pay off tremendously. You know, we, I live in a building, a high-rise building, where we have valet parkers. They, I just pull into the building and somebody parks my car. And there's people in the building that abuse these guys if they don't bring your car instantly or something. And I just think that's the stupidest thing in the world. This guy's got your car in his hands and, uh, and they can uh, be passively aggressive. But you shouldn't have to do it overtly for that. I just think it's the right thing to do to treat everybody in the department, the janitors, everybody as equals. I came from a very, very working class family, so this is, was part of my, uh, you know, my upbringing, but uh, I think uh, it's something sometimes people forget when they, uh, you know, get angry at a secretary for not doing something on time. Or, um, and beyond the department, uh, you know, staff in the dean's office are critical, people in the animal facilities, we have human research, you don't want to mess around with the IRB staff. Uh, and they're significantly important to your career path and day-to-day -day happenings. So the, the, uh, the reason I mention these is in this criteria, if you don't have these interpersonal skills, the department head and others will understand this guy, this girl, is going to screw up our, we have a very good working relationship with the uh, Animal Care Committee. And this has happened. You have one person who abuses that committee, lies to them, and just ruins the whole relationship. So you look out for that. That's, it's, it's very, very important to get your work done. So I'll come back to uh, this list, and I have uh, two other comments that I wanted to make. I think uh, I thank you for your comments, and uh, I hope some of this has been useful. Like I say, I think you're inundated with this sort of stuff, but I think it's, uh, it's worth sitting back and considering these. And I have two other comments. Uh, that I wanted to make before finishing. Uh, the uh, first one is about the interview. And I don't know if many of you saw this in the New York Times uh, uh, on April 8th. And it was just struck me as when I saw this, because we do a lot of interviewing of a lot of people, and it just said the utter uselessness of job interviews. And the point of the article, which you can, you can uh, click on this site and read the whole article, was that uh, they said employers like to use free form unstructured interviews in an attempt to know a job candidate. And they have evidence in this that the interviews uh, typically uh, form strong but unwarranted impressions about interviewees, often revealing more about themselves than the candidates. And this is documented by in this, uh, there's actual research done on this. So, you know, in thinking about this talk and, and uh, the interview that one has to uh, make, uh, what you have to hope for is that you get a, um, uh, a structured interview that is um, generally applied to all of the candidates. And uh, uh, the reason you want this structured interview is that uh, uh, they, uh, this unstructured uh, chat with a person can be harmful uh, and undercut the impact of more valuable information about you as an interviewee. And so I think one of the things that it, it uh, suggests is to steer the interview away from idle chatting or personal questions, which are fun to talk about. But you're, uh, you want to convince them that you're the best person for the job. And one has to stay on target with that. And you have to do that in a way that's glib and clever and uh, in, uh, that isn't a, uh, uh, ruins the interview. So I thought this was worth uh, mentioning uh, uh, with regard to the interview. <clears throat> so the last thing I want to talk about is your life partner. And maybe some of you have noticed that in climbing this uh, passage to tenure track, I always have two people here. Because generally what you'll find in your life, if one chooses to have a life partner, which many people do, uh, that that life partner becomes a very important person in your career path. And uh, it's, it's, I think, important to recognize that as a very young individual. And I'm not sure I did. I might have been 
not as uh, sensitive as I should have been as a, a, a very young student. And we had children right away, so we had two babies at home while I was a graduate student. And uh, you know, I would work late sometimes, and my wife was stuck at home. And I'm not sure I was as sensitive that uh, as I should be. And one needs to. Uh, and she'll tell you the same thing, I'm sure. We've been married 51 years, by the way, so the marriage lasted. Uh, but uh, many times, uh, candidates come in with uh, what we call the two-body problem. And uh, we were discussing this at the table. The two-body problem is that there's two individuals that need jobs. Many times, both of them, they met in graduate school, fell in love. And both of them are looking for jobs. So one has to learn how to deal with that and deal with it in the uh, interview process. It's not that uncommon. And um, uh, the other thing I think is to be prepared to make the sort of sacrifices that are required. If you really love someone, you'll make those sacrifices. Uh, they should expect it from you. And you should expect. So my wife is a nurse practitioner. She phone was ringing off the hook wherever we went for her to get a job, but she still had to agree to, we moved four times, and she had to give up her practice and uh, move, and, you know, we discussed it and everything, and, uh, uh, but it was, it was very well thought out and planned so that when we, <laughs> there was no explosions at the other end, because uh, uh, a lot of times, if I have to leave early or something, I always say it's just, I have to keep my happy home. And Kathy has a, a concert tonight at 6 o'clock. I'm out of here. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was worth mentioning just in terms of your overall thought processes and uh, how you approach this career. And just lastly, uh, several of my postdocs have gone on into biotech and into large pharma. They're doing very well. It's a very exciting atmosphere with limitless uh, uh, resources, great ideas, wonderful people. And uh, so I think although I was asked to emphasize a, you know, a career path as in tenure track, uh, many people, uh, and I've had students say, oh, John, you know, I've heard you don't want people to go to the dark side. <laughs> this is absolutely not true. Because I do a lot of consulting for biotech in, con in particular. And uh, so I think one needs to sort out how you want to deal with uh, those career paths as well. There's advantages and disadvantages to both. In many of these departments like ours, uh, you have to bring in salary dollars. And uh, it's not as uh, pernicious as some places where they only guarantee you half your salary if you lose your grants. So you have to look into that and then decide where you want to go with your life and how you can enjoy yourself. So. Well, I thank you for your input, and I'm just looking out here. I think most people <laughs> kept up <laughs> and are awake, and so that's good. And uh, it was a lot of fun for me. I hope it was useful uh, for you. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, thoughtful talk. I just had a question about um, you. In one of your slides, you encouraged us to explore other topics that are maybe not as central to the theme of the lab. How, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who wants to do that but also doesn't want it to be interpreted as a, a loss of focus in research? Yeah, so that's, that's an extremely good point, et cetera, because I think that uh, that's why I said the theme um, is important, uh, and uh, uh, I don't think people will, so I, I ran into one of my former colleagues who's now in Denver, and you, pot is legal in Denver. So she discovered if she gives tetrahydrocannabinol to mice that they develop an arrhythmia. And so she got money from whatever it is in Colorado that funds these things through, the, uh, through pot. And uh, so she, she was having trouble getting her NIH grant funded. 
So she went into a parallel set of, but it's still thematic for her. So she's a vascular biologist, actually. And I guarantee you that at one point or another, uh, she'll investigate some aspect of cannabinoids. Unfortunately, there's 500 cannabinoids uh, on probably vascular smooth muscle and take it from there. So I think it's important to have, you can, the focus can broaden out, but I think it's important to stay thematic. When I was um, an assistant professor, uh, the National Cancer Institute arose at NIH. And a lot of people switched from doing reproductive physiology to cancer research, unrelated, and they didn't do well either. They were just going after the money. And I'm not sure that's the best thing to do. I, I, so I think one has to stay somewhat on focus, but uh, people won't accuse you of uh, getting diverse in, uh, as, as a negative thing, I don't think. No. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, enjoy the rest of your day. And, uh, <laughs>